12, and we're looking at the first two verses that are so familiar to us, but I want to go at it in a little different way today, and hopefully be an encouragement to you in your walk before the Lord. The Bible says in these two verses, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I really want to have this scripture uh, in mind while we uh, talk about the topic of worship. I left uh, preaching about worship and uh, devotional life and worshiping God has been so important uh, to my relationship with the Lord and has helped put me over so many times. Uh, that I want everybody to know and, and be able to have full appreciation as much as possible for what that means to their Christian life, of course. And in many ways, I would title this message, Living the Lifestyle of Worship. Uh, as you know, last week we spoke somewhat about lifestyle, the conversation the word is from Philippians chapter 1, where Paul the Apostle said, Let your conversation be as becometh the gospel. In other words, our lifestyle ought to be something that is consistent with the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, a great part of our lives as Christians has to do uh, with our worship of God. And worship is such a huge topic in the Bible. You find it in Genesis, and you find it in Revelation, and you find it everywhere in between. And I've said it several times to you that what we worship and how we worship determines so many things about our lives, and that's why we have to give it a lot of time, in my view, uh, that uh, emphasizing the worship life of the believer is uh, the right thing to do. It is something that uh, we will not uh, be sorry for spending time considering our devotional life. Amen. If we worship God, if we build up a great fellowship with God and worshiping God, the Lord can get things over to us that we might not receive otherwise. It's in worship where our hearts are humbled and our hearts are made soft and that we're able to be dealt with by the Lord. And that's why I think that worship is such a key to so many other things in our lives. And so we're encouraging during this holiday season as we've already had Thanksgiving, which Thanksgiving itself, is, of course, is an act of worship. And when I think about coming down to the Christmas holidays, of course, I enjoy the music so much and there's so many great teachings that are out there now that, that even the scientists have found out, you know, that all of creation is moving according to musical notes. As a matter of fact, they have recorded the things from outer space and they have decided that it is a very low octave of B flat, that uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, creation is. Uh, this music is in your DNA, it's in your physical body, it's in your, it's in your life, it's all around us. Our God has caused the entire creation to be able to sing forth his praises, isn't that true? So when you begin to look at it that way, you begin to realize how God is dealing with us through his word, it makes us want to give special attention to these things. And it makes us want to consider how, or what Paul the Apostle said to the people at Rome, how that should apply to our lives also. This scripture, we believe, and others teach us that worship is more than a public observance, but it's a part of God's transforming work in our lives. Did you see what he said here when he said, uh, that if you're not conformed to the world, uh, that we should not be conformed to the world, but be ye transformed. And of course, uh, there is a transforming work that happens when people begin to acknowledge the truth about God. The one reason that we worship God, of course, one of the great reasons, is so that we can acknowledge truth. Some folks kind of see God as somebody that is self-centered and self-absorbed, sitting up there on the throne and demanding to be worshipped. But the truth is, he would exist and go right along all right without our worship. He doesn't need our worship. Hello. <laughs> uh, but uh, the idea is, is that it's truth. You remember how the scripture teaches us about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Uh, the truth, of course, is what brings such deliverance and transformation in people's lives. When you worship God, you're acknowledging the truth that God made me and I didn't make myself. That God has blessed me and that it's not by my own power or my own hand that I've been able to receive these blessings. It's because of the grace and mercy yes. of God. Yes. It is truth that has so much to do with our worship. And that's why we want to help folks to see what the scripture is teaching here and to help them to take on a lifestyle of worship. 
that worship not just a public event, it's not just a Sunday morning happening, but it's a part of the everyday lives. Uh, one first person said, you know, God wants to, uh, you know, through worship we're able to bring God into our everyday lives. <laughs> Sometimes we think it's almost comical in a way by the way that we've been taught. But, you know, a lot of folks, uh, they think that if they worship, they kind of check the box. They did what's necessary. They offered their sacrifice. And so then they go away thinking, I can do what I want to do now. I mean, it's very different when I, whenever you actually want to worship. <laughs> you don't want to just worship so you can kind of salve over your conscience a little bit so you can just go on and do whatever it is you want to do. What I want to do is I want to worship the Father. Amen. I want to be in His presence. I want to glorify His name. I want to fulfill what He put me in the world to do. Can you say amen? I've already found out that I don't have it within me to be able to order my steps. So I want to worship the God that's going to lead me and take me to the place where he wants me to go. The God who has a destiny for me. The God who says, I'm thinking about you and my thoughts are toward you are good and they're not evil. And I'm going to finish what I started. I've got a plan for you and I'm going to complete it. And you're going to come and be with me in glory. And the worship is going to go on and on forever. Can you say amen? Amen. That's what we're thinking about this morning is that that kind of lifestyle of worship, yes. kind of lifestyle of worship that's going to prepare you for eternity. Amen. But you'll notice in the scripture, he says, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God. And of course, uh, I have uh, labored over this sometimes with you in Romans 12. And to me, it is thrilling because this is the statement that is made after 11 chapters of such tremendous theological teaching. It's referred to, the entire book of Romans is called the cathedral of the Christian faith. It is the zenith, the high point of the Christian faith. If you come through those first 11 chapters, you come to a conclusion that man is not saved by his own works. Isn't that true? Yeah. That uh, the just shall live by faith and that it uh, that there's no way you and I could redeem ourselves. As a matter of fact, it also teaches that everybody has the same need Everybody has fallen short of the glory of God. And then instead of making Gentiles like Jews, the Lord is saying, look here, I made the Jews to understand that they're actually like the Gentiles. And that is, they're in this world without God unless they call upon God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that true? Right. Right. See, the Jews were thinking, now, if we're going to get these Gentiles in, we've got to proselyte them and get them to become Jewish and then that's how they get into the kingdom and then the Lord just turned that around and said in the book of Romans there is no difference between Jew and Greek that all must come by faith that everybody must come and put their faith in the finished work of Christ once he teaches all that and gives so many wonderful teachings and one thing after another great theology you know instead of coming to chapter 12 verse 1 and just saying and, of course, be aware that there were no chapters, no verses when he wrote it. He's just writing it like the way you would probably write a letter. You don't probably write letters where after you write a, a little bit, you say, well, chapter 2. <laughs> you don't write it that way. It was put in there for reference sake so people could find the place where it was written, just like you found Roman Church. But it's written as a letter. So when he gets to this point after talking about all of these august and majestic pieces of theology, he didn't just say, well, thank God for it. No, he says, I beseech you in the light of everything I've written about, all these mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. In the light of this mighty work God has done, now you have your work to do. You can't work for salvation, but you've been created in Christ Jesus as unto good works. Isn't that right? You are the workmanship of God created unto good works. You can't work do a work that would save you, but now you can do the work that has to do with being a worshiper. Now offer up your body as a living sacrifice. Think about this, that he's talking to the Romans. The Romans knew a lot about sacrificing. The Romans had the empire to make such a claim on them that they were required to make sacrifices each year. And they had gods assigned to them in their home, and they had gods assigned to them publicly. They had certain gods they would venerate out there in public, then they had other things that they would do in their home. And the father, most of the time, would lead the family in honoring some ancient ritual for some uh, god, you know, that they'd come up with. It would be certainly some pagan god uh, within their home. And the father would get up and go through the motions. When that was over with, 
They were like, let's get back to doing what we want to do. <laughs> That's why I don't want to worship God the way that people worship pagan gods. That's how people do pagan gods. Look here. And they, and they tell us from history that during the time of the Roman Empire and the Bible being written and Paul being in prison, during that time, people were getting very, very bored and unsatisfied with those pagan gods. I mean, it wouldn't take long to get unsatisfied and bored with them anyway. That's right. Amen. That's right. So it's called in the history book, if you look up the history book they use in Christian schools and what have you, it was called a time of ferment. <laughs> Which means the whole earth was like a bubbling cauldron of people looking around trying to find some kind of meaning for their lives. Does that sound like a, a present hour also, this time of ferment, where people are looking around <laughs> trying to figure out what is truth, what is worthy of my worship, what is my place in the world, and thank God all of that is answered in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All of those questions are answered in the fact that God has made us for himself. And the one thing that he asks from us is that of worship. And it's not that it's a selfish thing on his part. Matter of fact, him calling on us to worship is his way of delivering us. Because if we worship ourselves, we will destroy ourselves. That's right. It's the love of God that calls on you to acknowledge Him above all else yes. because the truth is yes. He is above all else. Yeah, amen. It's truth is what causes this worship to have the power that it has. Makes me want to stop and just go ahead and worship a little bit. Can you say amen? amen. Now, isn't that the way Paul did? He'd be writing an epistle a little bit and then he'd have to stop and say, Now unto Him that is able, <laughs> glory to God, amen. now unto Him that is all wise, Every once in a while, it would bubble up within him. He'd hit a gusher. Can you say amen? amen. I used to love it when in our church services, we hit more gushers, the same way. How many know the river's still flowing, though you can still hit a gusher? Hello? <laughs> Do you know why people like to go out there and look at Old Faithful? Because it's faithful. <laughs> Isn't that right? There are other geysers, there's some that shoot up higher, some more beautiful and all that, but they know that about every 80 minutes that Old Faithful is going to shoot up out of there and they're going to get a good view of what a geyser does when that pop-off time comes. <laughs> and when the heat builds up, everything is just right after about 80 minutes, it shoots up there and people are amazed. They're amazed by what they see. And rightfully so. I mean, know oh, that uh, sometimes it's hard to generate hot water anywhere, but uh, they got it shooting right up out of the ground. <laughs> That's pretty good. I don't think you're going to get it on you. <laughs> but uh, there it is. It's faithful. And I'm here to tell you, God is faithful. God is still, his spirit is still in the world. You and I, we can hit a gusher every once in a while if we will begin to uh, change the environment, the atmosphere. Yeah. We can't wait till somebody else worships God. We can't wait till somebody else gets right. We've got to go ahead and get right ourselves and go ahead and consecrate our own hearts. Can you right. say amen? amen? He said, just go ahead and live as a living sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Those Romans knew that their government at one point, particularly after this, and of course at the time of Paul the Apostle's martyrdom, it's getting pretty close to this, where they had compelled speech. That means you had to confess that Caesar was Lord. And you had to take a pinch of incense and put it on the altar and burn that incense. The fire on that altar would burn up that incense and create a smell. And of course, that is something that went along with the paganism as they, they worshiped their own emperor. And of course, eventually that's how that they uh, were able to have a legal right to kill Christians because Christians oftentimes would not recant and they would not burn the incense and they would not uh, speak the compelled speech. It's a little sobering knowing that now we're getting into a time where our own government is starting to tell us that we have compelled speech. We've got to call people by certain pronouns. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. Uh, there is a, we're coming to that time, and nations around us are already there. Others are telling us that this is the way it's going to go. They're going to tell us you can't speak in the name of Jesus. They're going to say, you know, you can keep it in the four walls, but you can't, you can't be on Facebook Live. You can't do other things. You can't speak the name of Jesus. That time's coming. It has to be. There's, there's no alternative. Isn't that right? Oh, man. You know, the, uh, the thing is set for this. This is the way it is. The die is cast. The gauntlet has been laid down. The way from here to glory is, is that I've got to hold on to the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to be a true worshiper in a world that has so much falsity, so many things that are false, so many things, false prophets and false teaching and false ministers. False apostles, false churches. That's 
synagogues of Satan. But in the middle of it all, there's going to be some true worshipers. They're going to keep on worshiping God and giving God the glory. Whatever the cost, whatever the price, we're going to praise him and live a lifestyle of worship. We're going to offer our very bodies as a living sacrifice before Amen. God. Amen. God not requiring us martyrdom per se. He's not requiring that our bodies be offered up as a sacrifice the way you would think of it sometimes in the Old Testament or in the ancient world, or maybe sometimes even in the modern world. But he's asking, uh, his uh, appeal is, he says, I beseech you, therefore, uh, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. You can imagine what all the Romans had done with their bodies before they were saved. Now he's uh, writing a letter to these Romans who have gotten saved and saying to them, present your bodies as a living sacrifice now unto God. Used to, you went down to the temple, you interacted with all the different types of worship, the pagan gods, the very uh, things that caused such debauchery. You were living a life, you know, where you were just completely surrendered to and connected with all those things that all of that represented. But he says, now, he said, I beseech you. In the light of all that God's done for you, in the light of the mercies of God, how merciful God's been to us, and the light of this mighty work he's done in us, now live a life as a living sacrifice. All right. God help us do it. Can you say amen? amen? I said to you last week that the collective lifestyle of the believer, our testimonies together is more powerful than any sermon we can offer, anything else. If you take a Christian community and they're all living as a holy living sacrifice before God, don't you think that's going to speak to the world around us? When we deny uh, the lust that is destroying this world, when we deny so many other things, all the things out there of the world, if we refuse to be conformed to the world, uh, one fellow says that means to be pressed into the mold of the world. I mean, the world has its mold. Yes. And they're distinct and definite, and they tell you, you've got to fit into this if you're going to fit in with us. <laughs> but brethren, there is no life in it. There's nothing but death. Right. In loving the world. If you love the world, then the love of the Father is not in you. That's right. And the fashion of the world's passing away. If you love this world, it's soon coming to an end. It is. So therefore, brethren, you want to raise your sights a whole lot higher than Amen. the things of this world. You want to set your affection on Amen. things above and not on things Amen. on the earth. Amen. My sermon last one Sunday was that we're living in the in-between. Here I am, feet on the earth, but my hands are raised toward heaven. I'm here between heaven and earth. There's coming a day where I'm going to be more in heaven than I am in earth. Amen. Right now I'm a little bit more in earth than I am in heaven. <laughs> I'm going to let them keep my earth suit. They're going to put it out here in the ground. Can you say amen? <laughs> But I'm going to be more in heaven than I'm earth. I'm living in the in-between right now. But this is my opportunity to bear witness of the God who transforms lives. Amen. We're saying that our life has been transformed. We're not saying we're perfect. We're not saying that, uh, that we never miss it, that we're not physical flesh. Uh, we have a real body, of course. But we're saying uh, that by the grace of God, we're doing everything we know to live this life of sacrifice. Yes. Knowing, brethren, that a sacrifice this way, living for God, is really no sacrifice at all compared to the other way that if we live according to the world, that's the real sacrifice. You're, you're giving it all up then. You're giving up eternity. So if we're not careful, we put so much emphasis on the sacrifice. How I many of the, the real loss, the real sacrifice would be if you don't live this way? <laughs> But of course, in the light of the altar and a priest and all that, you can see the terminology. That's the right terminology, a living sacrifice. Yes. And it's so consistent with Acts chapter 13. The Bible says that when those prophets and teachers came together, they ministered to the Lord and fasted. And I thought that was most interesting because it says uh, that when they ministered, that that means that they, they offered sacrifice, they praised God, they interceded for others. I mean, brethren, that is our work as Christians today. We are offering up the sacrifices of praise. Amen. Thank God we're not having to offer up dead animals. We're not having to uh, do those type of things, but we're offering up worship. We're offering up intercessory prayer. We're praying for others. We're praying for those who possibly are not praying for themselves. We're praying for the lost. This is our work as priests around the altar of God. A lot of times, you know, it's God where folks just kind of are not preparing themselves that much for public worship. And I know there's so many things to do, and some folks have special challenges along this line. 
But you know, there was a time when we were taught more so to prepare yourself before you come to the house of God. Prepare for public worship. When you're a leader in churches, of course, to prepare for it because, brethren, these are special moments. We don't have a lot of opportunity to be together in church anymore. So when we do come, we need to have a prepared heart ready to offer up the worship to God and those things that God has called on us for. And without it, brethren, if we're unprepared, a lot of time we miss out on that deeper moving of the Spirit. For many, worship, when you say the word worship, their mind just turns to the music and turns to the singing and all that, and that is a precious part of it. But I remember that there has to be something more to the worship than just the musical aspects of it or the things that we kind of kind of like. Like somebody said to me when I was special one time, they said, I can't wait for the worship service. That's the phone part. You know, there's music and the songs and all that. Of course, I love playing music, and it is the fun part. I mean, no, that's not the only part of it that is enjoyable. That's not the only part of it uh, that has to do with worship. That's right. Of course, people have found ways to fight, to fight huge battles over, over worship, over the songs, and <coughs> older songs or newer songs. And here in the Hebrew, it says that we're supposed to sing a new song, a song that's never been written before. I mean, I'd be pretty brave to get up and start singing a song nobody ever heard before and nobody ever written before. <laughs> Hello? Well, we have a lot of times, and certainly in larger churches, and we, we're, not against the, we're not against them, we're not being, uh, you know, negative about it, but sometimes they got everything down to the point, it's like a, it's like a Broadway musical. <laughs> and we can appreciate that, and we appreciate all the hard work and talent that goes into it, and God can bless and use that. But how I many brethren, there are other things that have to do with worship. God's called upon every believer to worship God. Amen. That's why, you know, it's kind of good sometimes when folks, uh, when they come, that they open their mouth and they begin to sing too. I love hearing you sing when we sing sometimes because, you know, it reminds me of how we are one people worshiping one God. And we're not here just to put on some kind of a show. Amen. Are you out there with me? <laughs> And I'm afraid it's been reduced to that a little bit. A lot of time you go into these churches, especially if it's a huge church, it's really more like a concert where everybody just stand up and listen to the ones on the platform. And that's okay too. Part of that is the right thing. There was a sing-song thing going on in the book of Psalms when they would sing back and forth. One, one group would sing half of it and the other was, would do it in sing-song fashion and sing back and forth. They would sing, you know, the the Lord is good and his mercy endure forever. <laughs> you know, they would say, God is good. The other crowd would sing all the time. Now they'd sing all the time, God is good. <laughs> they'd encourage one another. Like, there's nothing wrong with some of those things per se, but it seems like it kind of gets out of balance of them, where a lot of folks uh, can just uh, reach a point where they're not vocalizing their faith through worship. And it's just a one-time event. And if they attend church just a couple of times a month, then... Uh, just a few times a year that they come around and do that. That's why we're encouraging cultivating a devotional life and a lifestyle of worship. I want to worship God whether having church or not. I learned a long time ago how to have church by myself. Uh -huh. It hurts my feelings sometimes when more people don't come. But I tell you what, I'm going to praise God. I'm going to worship God if I'm all by myself, uh -huh. up on a mountaintop somewhere. If I'm out there right. hunting deer, if I'm in a deer stand, I'm going to praise God every once in a while. Right. I'm going to have to slip up my hands and say, Lord, I praise you. Glory to God that I got up this morning and the blood is warm in my veins and I'm in my right mind. Can you say amen? And that I'm serving you and praising your holy name. Glory to God. I know there's a lot of things that begin to well up within you that cause you to want to praise him. Isn't that true? Amen. And he says, this is your spiritual worship. Romans 12, 1, the very latter part of that verse, notice it says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Of course, he's saying to these Romans, not everything's acceptable. If you go back down there to that old pagan temple and do things you used to do, that's not going to be acceptable. It's going to be holy. People avoid the word holy all they can anymore. Seems like. Holy. <laughs> yes. Totally separate from the world. Holiness under the Lord. They used to sing that song when I'd be in Jamaica. They'd sing holiness under the Lord. It's our watchword in our song. Holiness under the Lord all the day long. 
Yes. Brother, we need to get talking about holiness again. We're not talking about a denominational uh, idea somehow or another, just legalism set forth by denomination. We're talking about drawing close to God and being separate from this world the way the Heavenly Father is separate from this world, That's sister. Right. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Amen. Without that, it's not acceptable to God. He says, which is your reasonable service? Or we could say, this is the least you can do. <laughs> In the light of all this mercy, in the light of God sending His Son, working with the Jews and working with the Gentiles, all the things that you think about, all the great theology, we're thinking about Romans 4, Romans 5, Romans 6, sin shall not dominate you, one glorious teaching after another, in the light of all that, of the living as a living holy sacrifice unto God, that is the least I can do. Yes. Help me preach a little bit this morning. Yeah. This is the least I can do to say, Lord, I want to live a lifestyle of worship. Amen. I want to live a lifestyle yes. that glorifies your name. After all you've done for me, the least I can do, my reasonable service. It's also interpreted from the Greek that this is our spiritual service. That's right. See, if you're not uh, following this about the worship, then you'll live too much in the natural. Here we are as believers. I mean, we're not to be dominated by just the natural uh, appetites like a man who's never been saved. <coughs> That's what Paul was saying to the church at Corinth. He said, you've been born again, but you're carnal. You're being ruled by your body. You've been ruled by the things of the world. Jesus. Hello. Uh -oh. <laughs> Somebody said a carnal Christian. That's an oxymoron. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but it still happens. If it didn't happen, Paul wouldn't say to them, even to the leaders of the church, he said to them, he said, many of you said, I'd like to talk to you like you were spiritual. But I can't do it because you're carnal. You're uh -oh. babes in Christ. Uh -oh. And that's what keeps people in the infancy of the Christian walk. When they should be growing up, here they are. They're bound to things that are earthy and earthly rather than, remember what the Bible says about wisdom, the sensual wisdom and the earthly type of wisdom is not the spiritual wisdom of the Word of God. It's through worship where people begin to gain some spiritual growth. Spiritual service here, that's what this is, that when we begin to uh, allow ourselves to be surrendered completely to our Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. Amen. We're calling on folks for surrender in this hour. We want to define Christian worship afresh, of course, that people know what worship is, because as I said, most people think when you say worship, it just has to do with the arts. They're thinking of music, singing, drama. The arts is what, when we think worship, most of that's what we're thinking. But remember that, first of all, worship has to do with coming before God and devoting everything to Him. Mm -hmm. Way back there in Genesis, when Abraham took Isaac up there, the Bible says they went forth to worship. Mm -hmm. Isaac said, where's the sacrifice? <laughs> he had a right to know. There's going to be sacrifice in worship. Something has got to be sacrificed. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? Yeah. And Abraham says, God will provide. Amen. You see, we can't even provide for our worship. We're dependent on God. We, have, we can never get to the place where we can brag about our worship or somehow or another boast that, hey, we're worshiping God. We can't even provide for that. We've got to have a round caught in the thicket. Uh-huh. And Jesus stands as the high priest of our worship. Amen. And thank God he's providing for our worship. Even though whenever I sing here, I would never want it to reach heaven sounding like that. <laughs> but thank God there's a wonderful middleman in between. There he is, the Lord Jesus Christ, the high priest of our worship. It goes through his ministry before the Father. Amen. i got to have help with my worship. Can you say amen? amen. amen. And thank God the help is there. Yes, Glory to God. Is. Well, there's many beautiful things, of course, when we think of worship, but in keeping with the book of Romans that you think about, and I mentioned a moment ago, Romans 6, he says to those same Roman Christians, he said, yield yourselves unto God. So Romans 12 and Romans 6, the thought of offering up our body as a living sacrifice and the idea of yielding our members, he's talking about the body. See, we have a time now, much like it's been at different points in church history where people want to say, well, if I do something in my body, that's my body. That ain't the real me. So if I sin with my body, that don't count against me because my body's got appetites. Mm -hmm. Hello? Mm -hmm. 
Once I'm saved, I'm always saved. So if I do anything with my body, then it don't really matter. I don't have to pray about it. I don't have to repent of it or anything else. But I'm here to tell you, the book of Romans flies in the face of that, hey, you, can, you know, you have this dualism. That's what it's called from Gnosticism. We taught about that at the Bible college. We were taught that originally. I preached 16 years before I took my first Bible college class. And so I'm not trying to be, you know, high and mighty about it. People know that, the people that know me well know I'm as country as cornbread when you get right down to it. But there are some things we need to know just because of what it means, the import of it to our lives. And that is, there's always been this tendency. People want to say, well, that was just my body. So I don't really count against me. That's not sin because God knows I got a body. You know, the belly for meats and meats for the belly. Hello. <laughs> but here the Lord is saying, surrender your body. Romans chapter 6. It says, uh, likewise ye are likewise reckon ye also your says to be de uh, dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. You have to have help to confuse some of these things. Isn't that right? And of course the devil is ready to assist anybody in false interpretation. <laughs> Isn't that right? That's why you've got through worship, you see, the word of God begins to overshadow your heart. And you begin to shed some of those old ideas. The thoughts you tolerate while you're worshiping has so much to do with how things turn out in your life. We talked to you the other day about Asaph and the 73rd chapter of Psalms. We preached Psalm 77 the other Sunday. But Asaph, he went to the house of God and he was having <coughs> the thought that got in his mind was that he thought sinners are doing better than the righteous are. He was mad at God because it looked like to him the evil people were getting along better and doing better than what God's people were doing. And he's mad about it. He's discouraged. He said, I almost slipped. He just about backslid over it. Almost lost his faith. But he said, when I went into the house of God and began to worship the Lord, he said, then I began to understand. I mean, that's why people need to be in God's house. That's why we need to have worship. That's why it needs to be a lifestyle. Because in that worship, God overturns your wrong thinking. We try to do that from teaching and preaching, and that can help, of course. But also, you have to have your own relationship with God. And while you're worshiping God, sometimes you know what you find out? You find out you're the problem. Hello? Uh -oh. I can't tell you how many times I'm embarrassed to say so, but I've gone to pray for other people. I've prayed for churches I've pastored. I've prayed, and then during the midst of that prayer, the Lord kind of let me know, you're the, you're the one holding things up. <laughs> And I think, boy, this is a humbling experience. I mean, no, that's exactly what God wants to happen is that in worship and you get genuinely humbled. Yes. Somebody said, is God trying to humiliate me? No, he's not trying to humiliate you. He's trying to keep you from humiliation. Mm -hmm. If you humble yourself before him, he will exalt you. That's right. But if you don't humble yourself, you will humiliate yourself. Mm -hmm. Are you there? Amen. And the word of God says here to uh, reckon yourself dead unto sin, then yield to your members as instruments of uh, righteousness unto God. He first says to them, don't uh, yield yourself as instruments of unrighteousness, but as those that are alive from the dead, he said, uh, yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. May this be a time where we once again afresh say, Lord, I yield myself Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Help me to be a true worshiper. You know, I looked in the Bible this week to see how many times it said worship or worshiper. And you only have a few times in the New Testament it talks about worshiper. And of course, the most famous verse is John 4, 23, when the Bible says, the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So worship there is not just the verb of worship, the action of worship, but the worshipers, they are, there are people who are worshipers. We've talked about already being true worshiper. So I looked that up and it says, those who adore the Lord, those who adore him, oh come, let us adore him. What do you say? Amen. And it says, those who prostrate themselves before God, uh, this is the type of adoration where they just fall on their face before him. 
That's the idea behind the word when it says they're true worshipers. That they just surrender all to God. They yield themselves completely all to God. Amen. I'll close today with just a couple of stanzas from All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. And it says, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. O seed of Israel's chosen race, now ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Brother, we come this morning to bow before the Lord and adore him. Yes. That's our worship. Can you say amen? amen? If you'll stand with me this time, brethren, we'll honor the Lord's presence, of course, and ask for God's help. May we yield ourselves afresh unto the Lord. And I pray that this holiday season will be characterized by worship in your life and in mine. It may be such precious times of being in God's presence that it changes us forever. That we're transformed by the renewing of our mind in his presence and in during these times of worship. Let's pray together, brother. Honor the Lord this morning. Father, we worship you, God. We bow before you. We adore your name, Father. We thank you for the mighty work you're doing in your people everywhere. Wherever there are people, Father, that are worshiping you in spirit and in truth, we thank you, Father, that you are revealing and manifesting, Father, your presence and your power. Should there be someone here today, Father God, that needs ministry, we pray right at this moment that while we're worshiping God, that uh, Lord, that something beautiful will happen, that a wonderful healing will take place. For those that are watching, we pray that a marvelous presence will begin to overshadow their lives and help bring hope, Father God, in these hopeless situations. We thank you, Father God, that this is the greatest weapon we have, Father, to be able to glorify your name in the midst of this world. Thank you for it, God. We praise your name. We glorify your holy name in Jesus' name.